So it's really you know, quite unprecedented what happened um, in the U.S. oil uh, economy while you were at EIA. And then, of course, as we know, over the last two and a half years or so, oils, oil prices have uh, sort of been in sort of the deepest crash that's happened mm -hmm. in quite some time. Um, and so with this as context, um, we think about one of the big roles that EIA does, which is try to forecast future oil production, forecast future oil prices. I can imagine this made your job pretty interesting. So, you know, how should we think about, uh, you know, how EIA sort of dealt with the sort of these challenges that came up, uh, both in terms of output and in terms of prices uh, while you were there? Uh, well, you're right that it was challenging. Uh, I got nominated uh, by the president in January of 2012, and then it took until uh, May, actually, to go through the Senate confirmation process, which is kind of happening now, and you see all of the difficulties associated with that. So while I was, uh, after I was nominated, uh, I agreed to work at the National Security Council at the White House. And I was there uh, between the end of February and the end of May. And one of the things that I was working on was the fact that oil prices actually had moved up to close to $130 a barrel, so even higher than what we saw sure. later on, because of the uh, Arab Spring and the revolution in Libya that took a lot of light, sweet crude oil off the market at the end of 2011. And so the, my job was to try to help uh, people at the White House understand what was happening and what was driving oil prices up. Uh, and then uh, we saw the impact that those higher prices, I mean, there's sort of two impacts that that has. One, you know, positive and the other negative. The negative one is, is that gasoline costs a lot more and politicians worry a lot about gasoline prices. Um, and uh, it, uh, when consumers have to spend more on energy, they don't have money to spend on other things and that can be an economic issue. Uh, the positive impact was, as you indicated, Tom, the huge increase uh, in production that we had, uh, not just for oil, but when oil prices go up, you generally tend to get, a, at least in the U.S., kind of a sympathetic rise in natural gas prices. So we had that as well. And, uh, and it really fueled um, the uh, growth in shale uh, both oil and gas activity in the United States, but leading to that uh, incredible growth in, in production. So on the gas side, it already started around 2008, 2009, and was starting to get underway. But oil, it was relatively new, and it was the Bakken was just beginning to come in, and then uh, other parts of, of uh, the country like the, the uh, Eagle uh, Ford uh, formation in Texas that was growing, that had profound uh, implications. I mean, by the time we got to 2017, if you just look, even after the drop in oil prices and how that slowed production down, the U.S., the dream of every president since Harry Truman was energy independence in the United States. We very nearly have achieved that. We're a net exporter of coal. We will be at the end of next year a net exporter of natural gas. Uh, we are already a net exporter of petroleum products. Um, the only thing that we're you know, on electricity, the U.S. is fairly evenly balanced. Uh, the, the, we're the only thing that we're not a net exporter of right now is crude oil. We're still importing four million barrels a day of crude oil. A lot of that comes from places like Canada and Mexico and other places in the Western Hemisphere, but uh, including Venezuela, by the way, that's a different story. If you're looking for what's the next crisis, Venezuela would be towards the top of my list. Um, the result of all of that was uh, a, a very different um, sort of energy dependency calculation in the U.S. Some people like it and some people don't like it. I mean, the way we uh, have managed to achieve this on oil and gas is through hydraulic fracturing. It's controversial. Sure. Um, one of the questions that I didn't get to ask, you know, when you're, when you're the administrator of the Energy Information Administration, you, 
generally speaking, are not supposed to have opinions on things. <laughs> and thank you for the laugh. <laughs> and uh, and I, there were a couple of things that I, I was really wanted to, to ask during the campaign when Senator Sanders, who hit a really sympathetic chord with people, um, campaigned. He was saying that he wanted to ban hydraulic fracturing. Now, right now, more than half of the oil being produced in the United States comes from hydraulic fracturing and about 60-some percent of the natural gas. In another 10 years, those numbers could be 80 percent of the gas and, and two-thirds of the oil. So a question that I wanted to ask Senator Sanders is, which OPEC country do you want to import the oil from if we're not uh, going to have hydraulic fracturing? And so one of the things that, that I, I learned uh, as administrator is, is that, well, there's, you really can't win with that kind of a, you know, because the answer is, well, we could have the other forms of energy. We could have renewables. We could have, um, you know, the other forms of production. Or we could have conservation. We could have the energy that we didn't use. And, and so now you're into a different kind of, of question. But the whole issue of, of how, uh, the oil and gas is being produced is one that's of great interest to a lot of people. I can imagine. So, you know, with all those changes happening, um, do you think it, it was it was actually harder to do the job that you had? You know, if you had if you had been the EIA administrator before either of these shale re uh, revolutions had happened, would your would your task of forecasting output and for, uh, forecasting prices have been an easier one or um, a, a more boring one or 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 you know, is it actually? Uh, easier now that we've got these assets in the United States with better data about them and we maybe understand the technological and economic motivations behind them better? Or what do you think? I mean, things are changing all the time. And I think uh, everybody that's been at the Energy Information Administration since the beginning in 1977 has faced some kind of challenge associated with data collection or analysis. Uh, the um, I think that that having all of the oil and gas coming uh, uh, as rapidly as it did, as sure. you indicated, created a tremendous challenge just in terms of keeping up with the data. EIA was used to collecting data uh, where having a two or three month lag and getting monthly numbers was just fine and, and not having the final numbers until a year and a half later was just fine. Uh, but when oil production was rising at a million barrels a day, sure. you know, from 2012 to 2013, uh, having lags like that simply wasn't providing the kind of information to the public and policymakers that were required. So there's an, uh, and I'll try to tell this story quickly. When I got to EIA in June of 2012, the annual energy outlook for the United States uh, for the year 2013 was really already kind of wrapped up. It hadn't been published yet because they were still writing some of the text, but all of the models had been run, the data was, was collected. And so, in, so I didn't really uh, pay a lot of attention to that uh, because there wasn't any input that I was going to be able to give that was going to make any difference to the outcome. But, I did note that when we published the preliminary data in December uh, and then the, f the final book in January, that when we published the 2013 uh, oil estimate in the, in the annual energy outlook, that we were, at, in January, we were already a half a million barrels a day below what was actually being produced. And I calculated by the end of the year, we were going to be like close to a million barrels a day off. So I called people in and I said, so like, we're really kind of off on this number. Like, <laughs> could you explain this to me? And I, I, you know, I wasn't yelling, I wanted to know. Like, what's the, I said, why don't you just like, don't try to tell me here because I want you to actually uh, quantify this. So take a few days and let's have another meeting and tell me what we did wrong. So they came back um, and what they said was, well, we were using, we, were, we wanted to start with good data. And the good data that we had was from 2011 that we then put into the models and ran the models in the summer of 2012. And, and, uh, and 
So that was why the number, because oil production increased so much during 2012 that we didn't capture. And I said, well, okay, so how can we fix that? That was actually how the drilling productivity report got started. Um, what I told people at EIA, by the way, was I said, look, being wrong, if you're in the forecasting business, you will invariably be wrong. If you're doing forecasting on Wall Street, you will also be wrong, but if you want to keep your job, you don't want to be wrong right away. <laughs> you can be wrong in a, you know, in a year later, and by then the issues will have moved on and you could have changed your buy-sell rating on the stocks that you're following and you're going to be okay. But if you're wrong right out of the gate, you know, so I said, well, let's just not do that. Let's not be wrong right out of the gate. And we found some ways to, to, to fix that. But that's like a cultural kind of thing, that EIA was very used to working in an environment where, where having precise data that was old was better than having estimates that were, that, that might have been a better way of approaching it. You know, that's a really interesting contrast you make between sort of the demands for private sector forecasting and public sector forecasting. So could you help us understand a little bit better what are the, essentially who, who are the customers for these kinds of forecasts from the EIA and why, you know, why is a, a short term correct number better for them or more important for them in, in some way that you know, these longer term incorrect numbers might, might be somehow more useful in the private sector? So one of the things, and I think it's important to think about this in long-term forecasting and short-term forecasting. I mean, it's easy to be wrong even in short-term forecasting. I mean, you know, the market goes against you. Something happens that drives prices up or drives prices down that you didn't anticipate. One of the things that you've written about is the impact that technology could have even in the in the short run. Um, your um, work on the uh, effects of technology and, and uh, the difficulties that creates in forecasting is, is really pretty interesting. Uh, long, in the long term, you know, EIA is now doing, when I got there, we were doing out to the year 2035, and then the clock ticked over and it was time to go five years more to the year 2040. And then just as I was leaving and you know, getting ready uh, in 2016, we were ready to go to 2045, and I, you know, put my hand up in a meeting. I said, 2045 sounds like a really boring year. I'm like, who, you know, 2050 sounds like a much more interesting year. Just the sound of it is more interesting than 2045. Why don't we go to 2050? So we are. EIA's forecast now go to the year 2050. So we skipped, you know, that interim step. And you kind of go, how can you possibly have a forecast that's correct for the year 2050 or even 2040? You know, it's like, who are you kidding, yeah. right? And, and, and why should you pay as a taxpayer, you know, for that to be done, which kind of gets to your question. So there's actually a really interesting answer to this. Um, what the end point is for your forecast in the year 20. 40 or 50 is not necessarily the goal. The goal is to test how sensitive that endpoint is to changes in your assumptions. What if you change the oil price? What if you change the GDP assumption? What if you change um, a rule like the clean power plan? So EIA has done long-term forecasts. What the clean power plan if it's in or out, what does it do to the, to the number? And so what's really interesting is not the end point, but the delta between those two scenarios, with or without. Because if the, if the answer was it doesn't make a lot of difference in or out, then we can all you know, stop thinking about that and move on to some other question. If it makes a really big difference, then policymakers might want to consider uh, you know, what that means and what the alternatives are. And so that's the value of long-term forecasting. On short-term uh, forecasting, I think what I found was is that, that the, the uh, public and policymakers were really confused by uh, the different coverage in the press for even some of the short-term issues. You know, what, you know, uh, this was one that we worked on. If you were to allow the export of crude oil, so there were rules on crude oil exports uh, in the U.S. for a long time. There was one big exception, and that was Canada. You could export 
crude oil to Canada. Um, but you couldn't export crude oil to Mexico, you couldn't export oil, generally speaking, crude oil. Uh, and one of the questions was, if you were to allow it, what would it do to gasoline prices? And again, I'm coming back to, what would the public really care about? What do you care about uh, in the energy area? And a lot of people put what the price of gasoline is very high at the top of their list. And what we found, and, and there were different stories out. Some people said it wouldn't, it would raise the price of gasoline. Other people said it would lower the price of gasoline by a lot. What we found was is that it would have a positive economic uh, benefit, net benefit, and it would probably slightly lower gasoline prices, uh, and especially in the in the coastal areas. That, it, that you might have a you might have a small increase in gasoline prices in some place like the Rocky Mountains, but in the coasts it would probably lower gasoline prices because more crude oil on the international markets would uh, lower uh, international crude oil prices and gasoline prices in the U.S. were generally being set by imports of gasoline into the East and West Coast. So what EIA actually found was is that some of the, the the, the kind of more aggressive, it's going to really push gasoline prices up or it's going to, you should do it because it's going to lower gasoline prices by a lot were wrong, that you could make up your mind on that issue as a policymaker, knowing that there was somebody that was looking at this from a nonpartisan, fairly independent standpoint that didn't have sure. uh, a particular point of view that they were trying to push. So it's really interesting that you, you, you frame these, um, these, these, these differences in, you know, with or without the clean power plant or with or without crude exports. Uh, the, the kinds of forecast evidence you guys are asked to, or you were asked to sort of create, were always about policy, right? So the, there's some decision that um, the Congress or the, an executive order would like to sort of push. What do we think this might do? Um, in contrast, some of the things that you oftentimes get graded on are in, in the sense of, you know, public looking back at what, you know, the EIA says and what actually happens are things that are not necessarily uh, in control, or, you know, the, the sort of the policy world's control. So for example, uh, when, when crude oil prices fell a whole bunch and uh, shell operators had to start thinking about how they were going to change their, their capital investments. And so one of the things that, 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 I, that I'm sort of really interested in here is, um, so when, this, when, when the oil price crash did happen, and this is not a thing, of course, that you were asked to, to, to write a model for, um, but I am kind of curious about how the EIA might have thought about this if, if Congress had, had posed this question to them. Um, was when this price crash did happen, um, you saw a lot of operators announce that they were going to cut their, their investment by a huge amount, usually on the order of about 50%. Now, when I, I looked at the data last night, and it looks like- Because uh, their income got cut by 50%. Exactly, right? So their, their, well, their income probably <laughs> right. got cut by even more than 50%, right? So prices from their peak down to you know, where they were in you know, early 2016 were you know, more, more, more than half, right? Um, but what, what I find really interesting about this is that, is that shale output, not just total output, just shale output in the United States is off by less than 15% of its sort of you know, early 2015 peak. And I'm curious as to whether or not that's something that EIA would have sort of predicted at the time. You know, so if we say we're gonna, we're, gonna cut, we're gonna cut output by, we're gonna cut investment by a huge amount, is you know, would, you, would, you, would EIA have forecasted a, a fall in production that was, that was only right. that small? Um, without you know giving you the spreadsheet or the the computer to sort of work it out here on the spot, is this the kind of thing? You know, are, the, are these the kinds of things right. the IE is thinking about? Uh, we did think about that in our uh, in our longer term forecasts. We always uh, tried to have scenarios that said what would happen if prices were higher and lower. So there's always a high and low oil price. Yes, scenario. exactly. Uh, we also tried to look at the technology question. It's not easy to do. Uh, but the way we tried to, to account for that in the models was to have uh, the, the costs of production come down. Generally speaking, uh, it was a small single digit number improvement per year, which if you're doing something over a 25 year period can be very meaningful by the time you get to the end of the period, but didn't account for what actually happened. Sure. So what happened, why shale didn't completely fall off the cliff is the industry in a self-preservation mode uh, said, what can we do to stay alive? How do, we, uh, how do we maintain cash flow? So what they said was, look, we're, we're gonna have 
half the number of rigs running or, you know, or, or less. But let's not get rid of the good rigs. Let's get rid of the less efficient rigs. Let's, we're going to have to fire some people. Let's see which crews are the best at drilling wells and we'll keep the people with experience. And, you know, so that's like last in, first out. The people that had the least experience were the, the first to go. So you used your best crews on the best rigs, on your best properties. Um, so you picked the properties that had the highest uh, recovery rates for shale. And then you used the best back to the technology issue. Then you put a lot of pressure on your oil service company suppliers to get you the kind of technology that would dramatically improve productivity. Uh, so we're back to hydraulic fracturing. They're using a lot more water and sand now in hydraulic fracturing, fracking of wells than they were two years ago. And the reason for that is it dramatically improves the pull of oil and gas into the, into the flow, into, into the wells. So they were able to maintain output with a lot less people sure. and rigs and even properties um, by changing the technology. So, I mean, one of the things, I'll try to make this quick, is the one of the huge breakthroughs is that, that it used to be you would drill a horizontal well and that well might have been maybe a couple of thousand feet long. Now you're drilling horizontal wells that are two miles long, right? So, but, but you had a 2,000 foot well and you would try to f fracture the entire 2,000 feet. And what they found was is that you would get little blowouts of where the rock was softer and all of the water and sand and, and the chemicals, and we can come back to that, were kind of all go in one spot and not across the entire. So then what they said is, if we could just segment um, the, the, this well into 10 sections that are 200 feet long, we can have a lot more control uh, over the process and that'll improve the throughputs. So they did that. So now one of the very clever things that, that could happen, and I think that the industry is really working on this, is it turns out that there's like an 80-20 rule. Um, you know, that, that, that in a lot of things that happen, the, that 20 percent of the effort gets you 80 percent of the result that you need. The problem is, is you don't often know which <laughs> is the 20 percent. Turns out that in these 10 segments, you know, in this 2,000 foot section, that there were two of them that were producing 80% of the flow. And so if you could identify ahead of time which of those two sections would be the ones, you would fracture those, reducing all of the water and sand and chemicals that you have to pay to do that, and leave the other eight just sitting there. If, you, if prices go up, you could come back to them later. So that would be like completely brilliant. And that's the kind of innovation that, uh, that, that EIA can't forecast, right? And and yet the industry has a tremendous incentive to do. I mean, so it's interesting. It sounds like it sounds like what what you're saying. The response is, is there's sort of two components here. One of them is something that the economists in the room would probably just call selection. So you said we're getting rid of the you know the least productive people. We're getting rid of the least productive assets, and we're only developing you know the most productive acres on, on the one hand. So that would be a pure. Uh, that would be just a pure selection type store. Right. And then the second piece is, is kind of what you began to hear, which is that among the things that we're going to focus on, we're going to do even better than we would have done when prices were high or right. something like that. And, and I know you just said that it's hard for EIA to, to, to think about how, how you ought to forecast that piece, but um, and to the extent that and to the extent we've been able to observe that you know this sort of real versus selection piece happening now, do you do you do you envision a world in which you know the next EIA is able to say, okay, we know that. The, the real piece of you know, productivity growth or innovation uh, in this sector you know, happened this quickly now. Now we can actually use this experience to try to forecast you know, what might happen in the next you know, boom and bust cycle of, of, of oil prices or gas prices in the United States? Right, well one of the things that, that EIA is looking at is more detailed, so finer data, um, looking at individual well data uh, and data on a pad basis and, you know, looking at counties rather than states and, and that kind of thing, uh, which should improve the ability to understand some of those changes that are taking place. Um, 
it's, it's also possible to build in a more aggressive technological change assumptions into the, into the models. Uh, the problem with doing that is if you don't know what the timing of that is, then you can either be, you know, you can overpredict. That was one of the other things that I actually, I think EIA is actually closer to doing that now. Um, the, the statisticians at EIA kind of got into something that they considered to be conservative. Conservative was, uh, it was always better to, it was better to underpredict output than to overpredict output. And I came in and I said, ah, you know, like I don't know like whether underprediction or overprediction is better um, on on things like output. Why don't we try to not have all of the errors have one sign? <laughs> right? Now there is a there is an interesting thing in pricing. EIA administrators never get yelled at if prices come in lower than their forecasts, but they get excoriated by congressional committees if prices come in higher than their forecasts. So there's a bias, actually, uh, for EIA administrators to prefer forecasts that are a little bit too high on prices because it's considered good if prices come in lower. I, you know, I don't know why that should be, but that's the case. So now you're kind of going, oh, those people in Washington, that's terrible. Um, I actually looked at this when I was on Wall Street. Wall Street analysts actually have exactly the opposite bias. They have a bias for low prices. So does anybody here have an idea? Why would a Wall Street analyst have a bias for low oil prices or low natural gas prices? You have buy and sell recommendations. Generally speaking, you have way more buy recommendations than you have sell 90 to right so so if you have a buy recommendation on a stock that works when oil is $40 a barrel and oil turns out to be 50 it just makes your buy recommendation look better if you have a buy recommendation and uh, and when prices are when you're saying prices are going to be 40 and they come in at 30 then it makes your buy look recommendation look bad because the company's going to be losing money. And so analysts on Wall Street, so the next time you see an analyst forecast on Wall Street, be advised to think about the incentives that those analysts have to. And somebody here uh, at the University of Chicago is smart enough to figure out a way to test this and see if I'm right. You're suggesting maybe Sounds like a PhD thesis to me. Anybody need one of those? You're saying we need, to, <laughs> we, we need analysts to report a schedule of prices, of, of stock price, oil price combinations that make this a buy. Okay, fair enough. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more about, uh, about shale before we move on to other topics. So um, again, while you're while you at EIA, shale grew a lot in the United States especially, but North America more generally. Um, but at the same time, um, you and previous EIA administrators have published research suggesting that the majority of shale assets, both in oil and in gas, actually exist outside of North America. Um, nevertheless, right. it really happened here. And so I was, I was wondering if you could share your, your perspective on you know, why, why, you think it, why, why did it happen here first? Is it this, a statement just about property rights and independence? Is it something about you know, uh, our, our relative abundance in water compared to other places that have shale? Or might it just be something about path dependence? Like, you know, we had the Barnett, and we've got agglomeration economies, and it's just going to happen here first. Right. How, how should we think about why it happened here first and not So why did else? shale happen here first? Um, so the, the, I have a theory of life <laughs> I'll share with you. <laughs> nothing in life, I, so far, this is, in everything that I've done, this is proven, nothing happens for just one reason. There's always more than one reason, right? So first we have to start off with the idea that there's probably more than one reason for why shale happened here. So there is a laundry list that people have gone through for what are the reasons that shale happened here. And, and one of them is uh, that we had a lot of independent companies, so the, the exploration production sector rather than the integrated oil sector, which is, willing to take more risk and um, right okay I, I know there's some people that are, that are going to know this and the rest of you can look this up on Google J.R. Ewing who knows who J.R. Ewing is 
Dallas. Now you're going to go Google this. Uh, the the J.R. Ewing was an independent oil, and he was willing to risk it all. Bet the farm that you know. Bet the house. Bet his family. I mean that he could successfully find oil and make a lot of money. And uh, and so one of the stories of shale is is that it was Mitchell uh, Oil and George Mitchell who persisted in trying to hydraulically fracture gas down in the Dallas area. And the name of this show with J.R. Ewing in it, by the way, it was called Dallas. And um, the second thing is, so you had a bunch of people who were experimenting. And the second thing was uh, with, with hydraulic fracturing. The second thing is the infrastructure that existed in places like Texas uh, to begin to do this was really pretty good. One of the interesting things is when they did find oil and there was somebody who was willing to bet the farm uh, at Continental Oil, uh, and that was Harold Hamm, and, uh, and Harold Hamm figured out how to get oil out of the, the formations in North Dakota, uh, but there was very little infrastructure up there and they actually had to haul that oil out by railroad, which had its own implications. And, and that's a different story about you know, Keystone Pipeline and whether we should have approved pipelines versus rail transportation to move the oil uh, and so on. Okay, so then you come back to well, is there anything else? And a lot of people say that they might even put this up at the top of the list, and I'm tempted to do that too, that private property in the United States, generally speaking, surface owners, so the farmer, the rancher, the person that owns the forest, the person that just happens to have property somewhere, tend to own the mineral rights. So there is an alignment of interest between, let's just stick with the farmer. The farmer and the and the, uh, and the company that wants to produce the oil or gas are aligned financially because the farmer is gonna get leasing payments to just to open the acreage up to, for exploration and then a royalty payment if anything is found. So France has got a lot of shale, but they have a ban on hydraulic fracturing and shale development, generally speaking. And one of the reasons is the farmers in France don't own the mineral rights. So the farmers in France get all of the risk and very little of the reward, and so it doesn't go anywhere. So the answer is all of the above. Then. All of the above. <laughs> um, all right, so one last question on shale before we, before we move on to other topics. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna really take my opportunity here to get your perspective. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that you, see, you see in news about, about shale in the United States uh, is that these wells, at least compared to what we think about as conventional wells, and especially compared to conventional offshore wells, shale wells are gonna be smaller in production, they're gonna be less expensive to drill at the outset, they're gonna come online more quickly, they're gonna, they're gonna peter out more quickly, uh, basically than, than any traditional uh, conventional source of oil and right. gas production. So they have lots of people have- Very sharp decline curves. Exactly, right. lots of people have pointed out that this makes sort of shale resources uh, much more, mu uh, it's much easier for them to respond to changes in, in demand, okay? So a lot of people have now called the North American shale industry that's sort of the new sort of swing pro you know, producer right. in, the, in the global supply stack. So first off, where do you actually buy that story? Should we think about shale now as the marginal barrel? And then more generally, you know, as more shale comes online in the United States and perhaps in the rest of the world, how should we think about shale affecting what we understand the oil supply curve to actually right. be? So there's probably a spectrum of responses to how quickly it can bring oil onto the market if it's needed or take it off the market. Right. Uh, but let's talk about putting it on. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to have something like a inventories. And if you wanted the government to be involved in that decision, you could have something called a Strategic Petroleum Reserve, SPR, and you could have oil being stored somewhere. And if you have a shortage, you could release the oil uh, into the market uh, pretty quickly. Uh, another way of responding to, uh, to the need for more oil to be on the market is to have somebody uh, that's an oil producer holding some oil off the market. Now, uh, that's kind of how OPEC was thought about for a long time. Uh, but if you just thought about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has oil uh, and they don't always produce to the full maximum capability that they would if you were 
uh, an oil company almost anywhere else in the world and certainly in the, in the US. You would simply produce to the point that you were profitable uh, and, uh, and not hold oil off the market. Uh, if you were holding oil off the market, then that, that would be, uh, in theory, uh, a, a anti-competitive thing, which would then, you know, possibly be if it was being done in, in, in conjunction with other companies. So, but Saudi Arabia has been able to increase its production, or as they are doing now within OPEC, taking some production off the market in order to try, as they say, to stabilize prices. Uh, and, uh, and then the th third and newer way that we're now looking at is shale, short cycle projects. So you can drill a shale well in a week, uh, you know, in a, in a matter of a few months, you could probably organize the movement of that oil and get the wells drilled and so on. And certainly within a year, you ought to be able to have shale responding uh, to, to an outage. Uh, EIA actually looked at that and our conclusion, and particularly with something called drilled but uncompleted well. So you drill a well, but you might not like the price, and so you don't complete the well, but if you complete it through hydraulic fracturing, you could get it on pretty quickly, and that's going to be a new short cycle way. The older issue in the oil industry, and it was one that always uh, uh, created problems, uh, and, and this is, you know, the, of all of the universities in America to talk about this, it's supply and demand elasticities, right? So I, I, I never have the right props with me, but, but <laughs> if I had the, the textbook. We do have it, a chalkboard right here, the so. Textbook, yes, we do have a chalkboard. I'm gonna use it. <laughs> this is so exciting. Here's a piece of chalk. Let's move, let's move this out of the way. <laughs> The, the textbook, this is price and this is quantity, and the textbook supply and demand functions look like this, right? And a little change in price gets you a decent amount of quantity. And what oil looks like is this. It takes a huge change in price to give you a modest change in quantity. In the short term, right? In the short term, right. And, it, and as a consequence, we, we are, okay, so nobody knows here about J.R. Ewing, but how about Groundhog Day? Has anybody seen Groundhog Day, the movie? I kind of feel like we're in this Groundhog Day environment of never being able to get away from this short-term price inelasticity uh, because the system simply can't respond to something that, that, that takes something off the market. Usually it's quantity. The quantity is lost due to a geopolitical issue somewhere in the world and prices skyrocket because you can't either get the production going or the, uh, the demand pulling off, right? If you've got a car, you still have to buy gasoline, even if the price of gasoline is now $4 a gallon instead of $2 a gallon. You do have the option at some point of getting a car that gets more miles to the gallon, but that might be sometime down the road, so it's gonna take a while for that response. So one of the things that Shale was supposed to do was to be able to, to ease some of that short-term elasticity problem and, and it's still possible that it's, that it's gonna do that. Um, one of the things that we saw in, in the early part of the 2000s, we had such a demand increase coming from China in one year in 2004, China's demand went up by more than a million barrels a day. And the only way the system could respond to that was having prices go up by a lot, that was when Oil, by the time we got to 2007, early 2008, hit almost $150 a barrel. A lot of people thought it was gonna to go to 200. I actually am in print somewhere, uh, and you can find this saying that, that it could go to 200, but only for about a day or two before it would, it would do enough economic damage to bring prices back down again. So what we're all hoping is, is that shale might take some of the economic sting out of this. It remains to be seen. All right. Well. I think we've heard enough about shale so far. Uh, I mean, <laughs> right. I haven't heard enough, but I think maybe the rest of the audience has. Um, 
So I'd like to actually move on to, uh, to a set of topics related to the current environment um, in Washington related to energy policy and to environmental policy. Um, uh, the new president uh, yesterday uh, issued a, an executive order that, call, that in, in, in a variety of ways is trying to pull back some of the energy and environmental policies that the previous administration ha had, had, um, had, had put into place. Um, and that's going to sort of uh, create um, a lot of situations that we, we hadn't anticipated uh, certainly several months ago. Um, one of the things I kind of wonder about uh, with, an, with an administration that's going to be a little bit more hands-off, perhaps, when it comes to thinking about environmental policy is the role that the market has so far played in achieving some environmental outcomes and may, you know, you know for better or for worse, be, be required to sort of uh, supply for environmental outcomes on an ongoing basis. So, in general, you know, should we think about uh, what, what renewables and what low gas prices have done in the last couple of years uh, towards uh, lowering uh, greenhouse gas emissions, towards uh, uh, reducing local, local pollution? Can we, can we expect more of that in the future, or is that something that you, you anticipate the current administration also having an effect on? Um, or or, is, or have we already gotten as much out of, out of that uh, sort of wedge as, as, we, as we can hope to kind of get? Uh, so what we're seeing from President Trump and, and the administration is a number of executive orders that are rolling back some of the uh, regulatory uh, decisions that were made during the Obama administration. Uh, it's it's going to take time, so that you can write an executive order and some things can happen right away. A lot of things actually have to go through an administrative process. And uh, that process could take a while and there will be uh, requirements for things to be published in the Federal Register, for example, to take public comments. Then there'll have to be some consideration of that material. Then you publish a preliminary finding and then people get to look at it. You know, you go through this whole thing. Um, so things aren't going to change right away. Clearly, uh, there is a desire on the part of the new administration to change a number of things. Um, some of it uh, will make more of a difference than others. Uh, there was, uh, we could look, one of the things that the president has talked about is allowing more leasing on federal land. Um, so EIA actually looked at this. You go on EIA's website and, and they did an overlay. There's tremendous mapping capabilities now that have been built into the EIA website and you can get a map of the United States. In fact, you can now do all of North America and you can look at energy infrastructure. Uh, and one of the things you can do is layer uh, uh, different things on. So I, uh, one of the layers that you can put on is federal land. And then the other layer you can put on is what you were talking about earlier, where the shale is. So it turns out that the shale, generally speaking, is not on federal land. So leasing more land uh, in the lower 48 states, uh, it's probably not going to make a whole lot of difference to oil or gas production in the United States, most of which is now coming at the margin from shale. Um, it could make a difference uh, in the East Coast, which has not been open for leasing and may be open for leasing, but that's going to take a while. It's that's offshore. back to the cycle. You're not going to be doing quick shale projects in offshore. Yeah, you're saying East Coast offshore. East Coast yeah. offshore from Florida up to Virginia. Um, so that's something that might make a difference five years from now, longer cycle projects. Uh, an interesting one that was an issue when I first started off as an analyst in the mid-1970s is the leasing in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge in northern Alaska, which uh, there is a part of that. It's a multi the whole idea of that area to begin with was, was multi-use. Oil development was possible, but nobody has ever been able to like, organize the legislation that would allow drilling to take place up there, but it's certainly possible that that's something that could be looked at again. So that would make a difference. And that, that might be one of those, because there's an existing pipeline and you could drill a well in a year and, and you know, probably within a year or two, you could get more, possibly more oil flowing into the Alaska pipeline. Uh, that would be shorter cycle than the offshore. But as far as that quick cycle onshore shale stuff, it's not going to make a lot of difference. The other thing, well, one last comment on, on this whole idea of what are the obstacles that the president is going to face. Um, okay, so it was very kind of uh, the, the school here to have w water in these bottles. 
Did anybody bring their own water bottle? If you did, hold it up. Come on, let's see. How many, you know, it's like maybe at least 10% of this room brought their own water bottle. So how do you fill your water bottle? Have you ever tried to fill that water bottle at a drinking fountain, the ones that, you know, where the thing squirts up? How much water can you get in your bottle? Not very much. So the alternative is you go in the bathroom and fill it up in the bathroom sink. That's like kind of disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get that at, at, at the old executive office building, they actually had drinking fountains that had a, a place where you could put a liter bottle and fill the bottle up. And, and the idea was it would cut down on waste, you wouldn't have as much plastic and, and that kind of thing. And it was very convenient for people that wanted to have their own water bottle. So I get to the Department of Energy and I notice people are using the tilt the bottle, you know, like at this incredible angle where you can only get, you know, a third of the bottle filled up at the drinking fountain or they're in the bathroom. And I kind of go, I'm the CEO of the Energy Information Administration, certainly on the floor that was mine, I could get some water fountains just like the one that's over at the old executive office building. And I'm kind of going, so I call the facilities people up and I say, I went online, my daughter actually lives here in Chicago and she worked for a company that makes drinking fountains at one time. <laughs> so, so I got an estimate, you know, it was maybe about $700 for the drinking fountain. I figured double that, 1,500 bucks, we could have a drinking fountain and I could put two or three of those in and I said, frankly, I would actually pay for that myself. That's a different story. <laughs> You're not allowed to do that. So I said, let's put some drinking fountains in. Employees would love that. EIA doesn't control the drinking fountains. That's the General Services Administration. It took me three years <laughs> to get a drinking fountain installed. President Trump is, is going to be beside himself <laughs> if he wants a drinking fountain in the Trump Tower, it's in the next day. That's what I thought I could do. I was going to like bring the drink, I was going to buy the drinking fountain and come in and put it in myself. Then I would have gone to jail for that, I'm sure. But <laughs> So keep this in mind. I, mean, I, I want you to leave here thinking about it took Siminski three years. He was a pretty competent guy, and it took him three years to get a drinking bound. Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. That, that, was, a, that, was, a, that was a fascinating story. Um, so one last I one got more. I got I'm more. sure you do. <laughs> Ho hopefully, hopefully I'll ask a question that inspires one. Um, so one last question about the Trump administration before we open up the open it questions. up. Okay, great. Um, you know, one of the things that that President Trump campaigned on was uh, ending the simultaneous wars on coal and gas, and lots of people with uh, sort of an, an energy background or an energy economics background, you know, looked at that and chuckled and said, "Well, hey, you know, you know, coal is having a hard time in the United States, at least part of which because." Is, is the fact that the gas prices are so low. So if we were to simultaneously end the war on both of these things, it's hard to imagine that coal could somehow come, up, somehow come out ahead. And many, many, many of my friends in this room and I had, had, had many a chuckle about this during, during the campaign. One of the things I'm curious about now, that, that, that uh, we do have a new president, who I think probably still wants to accomplish that, uh, is whether or not some of the things that he's talked about with respect to trade might actually make that kind of vision of his possible. And in particular, um, I'm interested in, in getting your perspective on how we should imagine energy exports, uh, especially related to coal and related to natural gas, as a means of possibly uh, sort of making good on the promise that he made during the campaign that we could sort of you know, increase the output of both of those things in the United States and maybe end the wars on those two fuels. Right. So uh, again, you can, one of the things you can do is, is you can try to look at how things change if you change the assumptions going into that. We talked about the modeling effort before. One of the things that EIA looked at was with and without the clean power plan, how much more coal do you get versus other fuels uh, and where does it come from? And one of the things that we found in doing that is, is that uh, without the clean power plan, coal 
doesn't actually go up, it just kind of holds steady at roughly its current amount. With the clean power plan, coal use declines by about a third and you get more renewables in the early part of, of a long cycle and you get more natural gas uh, in, the, in the later part. Um, another thing that we discovered was that to the extent that you do have more coal, that coal is more likely to come from western coal producers like in Wyoming than it is from eastern coal producers like in West Virginia. So one of the interesting issues about coal mining is that it's not necessarily clear that even without the coal power plan, uh, clean power plan, that you, you would uh, necessarily boost uh, mining activity in West Virginia. You might if you were going to be exporting a lot more, but that's another trade issue in the sense that how many, you know, where uh, U.S. coal exports haven't really changed that much over the course of the last, they've gone down a little bit. Um, it's possible that, uh, that some of the big coal users like China and India would, will be using more coal, certainly in India, but that's seems to be more likely to come from indigenous production in those countries rather than from the U.S. as an exporter. Uh, one of the other things that any, uh, any uh, sort of regulatory system will face is getting the permits for uh, building the infrastructure to allow for exports. And permitting uh, is often there are federal permits and the, the president can move things along there, but in many cases there's the need for state permitting and state permitting isn't necessarily uh, gonna follow a federal uh, rule and there's lots of reasons at the state and local level uh, for why you may or may not want to have development. One of my overall concerns is, is that uh, permitting has become the new way to prevent energy development and I, tend to come from a view that says energy development, generally speaking, has been a net positive. It's improved people's incomes, uh, you know, and, and what's happened over the last few years is our energy, generally speaking, is getting cleaner and so on. So I see that as kind of a good. So that becomes an issue. Um, so the, there, there will be a lot of nuances in how all of these, these rules play out. Uh, and I'm sure there are going to be legal challenges, and uh, so that'll that'll be an issue too. And it's it's back to the, you know, there's kind of a built-in system that says we generally tend to go slowly on some things, and there have been good historical reasons for why we've developed the systems uh, to, to do that, so that they get adequately considered. So we'll see how it goes. Interesting. All right, so let's open up the floor to questions. I think we're going to have about 15 minutes. Um, there's some folks in the back with microphones. Um, so let's start with this guy up here in the front in the yellow shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. It's very interesting. Uh, I think you've seen there's a premise which is circulating, at least in the energy sector, that in the absence of a swing supplier, and you addressed that Saudi Arabia played that role for many years, we're in for a long term of uh, increased volatility in, right. in the oil market. I'd like to hear your views on, uh, on the premise and if you really right. see that forward, uh, both on the short and the long term. Thank you. You know, that's, that's something that I've actually thought a little bit about. Um, there was, uh, I don't know whether anybody here has read Dan Jurgen's book, The, the Prize. Uh, it's uh, a really excellent book. It's, uh, was written uh, quite a while ago, but it kind of explains the oil industry. Uh, Dan just published a piece, a little short note, uh, a few months ago talking about crude oil prices and cycles. So cycles in crude oil pricing, and, and I was looking at, at this, and, and Dan identified um, at least four really clear cycles in oil price. So it's not just are we possibly going into a period of volatility. We could look backwards and say what has been volatility in the past. And, the, and, and I like to think about this in terms of decades. And these are my words, uh, not Dan's, that the 1960s were the year, that, that was the decade of Texas. Texas had spare production capacity. 
And there were actually a couple of world crises, the Suez Canal crisis, the, the uh, Six-Day War, uh, where oil supplies were interrupted. But Texas, literally, they could just turn the valves, produce more oil in Texas, and, and prices stayed relatively stable. Then the 70s was the year of OPEC. That was the 73-74 embargo, the 79-80 um, uh, Iran revolution, Iran-Iraq war. Uh, that was, uh, that was uh, the, 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 an issue. Then the 1980s, I called that the, the decade of anything but oil. Oil prices got so high that we decided that we just didn't want to have that uh, as an issue anymore. And then the 1990s was kind of a year, uh, that was actually when we were just getting started on the internet. And the 1990s was another year of very calm oil pricing. Uh, there were just other things going on. There was a lot of supply around and it didn't matter a whole lot. The 2000s, the aughts, was the year of China, the decade of China. That's when Chinese growth, economic growth, uh, and urbanization propelled a huge increase in demand for everything, uh, energy in all its forms uh, and, and minerals of all kinds. Uh, and now we're in the shale decade and your question kind of went towards you know well where are we going next and and again this is my word i think we're possibly headed for what i would call a decade of disorder where the combination of geopolitical issues and whether or not short cycle shale can fill in the gap that's being created because we are not investing in these longer cycle energy projects uh, that we might run into shortages again of of energy uh, and oil out in the next decade, the, the 20s. So we'll see how that works. But I'm, I'm back to that illustration that I was trying to do there. The problem remains that the price elasticities of, of, of uh, supply and demand for uh, oil are, are very inelastic, and that just leads to problems uh, that, that we have not really seemed to to be able to, to get around. Thank you for your question. Uh, right here and then right there. Thank you for your, your talk. Uh, to make a good energy uh, policy forecast, you need to have a lot of good economic data and modeling, but you also need a lot of scientific and technical data about the industry. You need to know about the politics and the regulatory environment. Right. Um, a lot of different fields, and at least in academia, the people who work on those things are siloed into different schools and departments, and they don't always talk to each other uh, very much. So I'm curious if you can tell us a bit about the challenge of putting together a team that integrates all those different kinds of knowledge. Isn't that what the institute is trying to do? <laughs> so, uh, so what, what you're trying to accomplish here, I think, goes you're trying to pull in people from the business school and. And, and elsewhere uh, here at the university to, to try to bring a diverse set of people together to, that might be able to work on things uh, you know, cooperatively to, that, that might be missed otherwise. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I did at EIA, um, and it, went, it goes back to this issue of we missed the the oil production forecast so badly in 2013. And one of the other things that I, I didn't get into was that the people who were doing the short-term forecasts were different than the people who were doing the long-term forecasts. Because the long-term forecasting is a lot of modeling. Short-term forecasting is, is more um, understanding kind of current events and how that might impact things. And, uh, and I think we, what I did was I actually, I didn't you know, quite merge, but I said we need more people from the long-term modeling to actually work on some of the shorter-term forecasts. We had people that knew a lot about auto fuel efficiency rules for the long-term forecast, and it turns out that gasoline consumption in response to the lower prices that came in, in, uh, in 2014 was very important. And the knowledge of how those elasticities would work was in the long-term silo and not in the short-term silo where you needed it to be. So we actually were able to 
bring those people together and it made for better forecasting, I think. Um, so yes, it's really important to do. Now, before we, are you a student? Uh, no, I, I teach history. You teach history? <laughs> well, okay, but you're, you're young enough to be a student. <laughs> That's a Starbucks card, <laughs> paid for by me. <laughs> Students, if you're as smart as you're supposed to be here at the University of Chicago, you might begin to see a pattern developing, we'll see. Yes, next question. Maybe I shouldn't discriminate. Uh, this is really. Are you a student? Oh, also, <laughs> I'd like to say that you're a student of history. <laughs> uh, Starbucks card for you. Uh, <laughs> is anybody seeing the pattern? I like questions. We're going to do rapid fire. Okay? I pay for questions. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, let's take from the gentleman in the front. Let you know, <laughs> let me ask you something about forecasting. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, to what extent does uh, EIA uh, interact and, and get information from industry on the, the technological forefront? And uh, is, uh, is industry, are industries willing to talk with EIA about the things uh, for the future, or, the, or is that all too proprietary to, uh, to, to talk to EIA about? Right. Um, that's a really excellent question. <laughs> um, so when I got the EIA, what I found was they were having some workshops where experts would come in and industry people would be there. Um, but the workshops tended to be planned way ahead of time. This is sort of like that long cycle kind of information versus shorter cycle. And one of the things that I wanted to know about was what was happening in the Bakken. Yeah. Right. So I actually called up Continental Resources and I said, you know, do you have somebody that can come in here and tell us about what's happening in the Bakken? And, and Continental Resources said, yeah, Harold Ham will come in and actually. And, and he, uh, they were surprised that they were invited to come in to, to EIA. Uh, and they actually provided us with a lot of really interesting information that helped us improve our short-term forecasts. Um, and one of the other parts to that is EIA has had for many years and must have to remain a good statistical agency, a good sense of, of uh, knowing what is proprietary and, and what isn't and uh, when we would have conversation, you know, there are things like uh, Chatham House rules, right? Like you can talk about what you learned, but not who you learned it from and, or where you were at the time that you did it. And um, we also had environmental groups come in and tell us, um, you know, what they were thinking, because I was very interested in knowing what was happening on this uh, social licensed operate area. It, you, you aren't going to have oil and gas development or pipeline construction or building electric transmission lines if they're going to be opposed. And uh, we saw that playing out in the, in the Keystone Pipeline decision. We saw that uh, in the uh, uh, Dakota uh, Pipeline. So the, the, those sorts of things uh, are, are very important. EIA, by law, there are certain things that we collect from industry that are not shared. They're aggregated and, and published, but individual data is not published. Uh, and, uh, and I learned right away uh, what those things are because um, one of the things in my very long career on Wall Street, I was on Wall Street for almost 30 years, I, I never got indicted for anything and I didn't have to go to jail. <laughs> and, and I was determined at EIA that I would not end up going to jail for doing, and there are <laughs> criminal penalties for divulging proprietary information that, that uh, federal statistical agencies have. And uh, so, so far, so good. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we'll do Sam, and then... Come on, where are the students? Uh, and, then, and then the student <laughs> next to the, the student in the green shirt who raised her hand. Um, 
So I'm not old enough to have watched uh, Dallas, but I'm I'm old enough to know what it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm old enough also to remember that uh, back in 2009 or 2008, before the current administration or the the previous administration, uh, you know, EIA did a lot less. If you went to the EIA website, it was real, real clunky. There was a lot less data over the last few years. I don't know. Uh, outside of researchers, how many people realize just what a suite of kind of like data innovations that you guys have have unfolded? Done. Um, and there's been a few things over the last, let's say, a couple of months that that make me wonder about that. Right? The, we just saw this thing with CBO, where CBO is supposed to come out with a score for a bill, and people say, "Well, it's, it's a long it's, this this bill is complicated. And it's going to take a long time to roll out, so we shouldn't listen to anything CBO has to say." What do they know? Uh, and so. Uh, you know, uh, you think about sort of the uh, blow up about employment statistics with BLS, you know, how do we rely on, you know, questioning the, reli the reliability of the data. Uh, how should we think about, or as you, uh, ha having now just walked out the door, you're looking back, are you concerned about kind of the future of EIA and, and government statistics? Are you concerned about uh, their ability to continue to innovate and grow uh, the budget as, as big cuts come in? Right. Um, well, EIA went through a big budget cut in, in uh, 2011 before I got there. Um, I kind of got the impact of it, but uh, there are things that can always be cut. There are always ways you can, you can do things better and cheaper, uh, and agencies can look for those. Uh, you know, I think you, that agencies in general could probably respond to budget cuts that were like 10% or 15%. It's going to be much, much harder if those numbers are bigger. Some of the numbers that were in this short budget paper were agency cuts, like at the State Department, that were close to 30 percent. I don't, you know, that's going to be a much tougher decision. At EIA, when the budget got cut uh, by roughly, I think it was 12 percent, uh, the international, uh, the energy outlook didn't get published. Uh, there were a number of other things that literally the agency couldn't afford to do. A lot of contractor work on, you know, longer term uh, forecasting got, got whacked. Um, I, I think that there, that statistical agencies in general have a, have a role in a democracy of providing unbiased data that can be used uh, by both policymakers and the public to try to understand what they're doing. I've always believed that it's better to have policymakers uh, basing their decisions on facts rather than conjecture. So um, the there was a proposal by one of the think tanks, a conservative think tank in Washington, to eliminate EIA. It was the Heritage Foundation, and they. They said that policymakers didn't need that. It could be either eliminated or privatized. Privatizing EIA is kind of like turning the clock back. The reason EIA was created is that the industry was providing a lot of the statistics in the 1960s and early part of the 70s, and there was, there, there was one case where there was clear uh, bias, fraud in, in numbers that were being submitted in, on natural gas, and there were always Questions. You know, one of the things that you that you learn the the ethics rules for for federal employees are to to not not do things that are that are barred, but also not to give the appearance of doing things that are barred. So the having statistics is is I think really important to federally collected statistics is important to that appearance rule. If all of our data from uh, um, oil was coming from the oil industry, I think there would be people who would say, gee, can we really rely on that? You know, so I think that's legitimate. Uh, and then finally, um, EIA has uh, legislative authority to require respondents to report and criminal penalties for fraudulent reporting. And that does not exist. Uh, so if you were to have a, if you were to privatize EIA, you wouldn't have that authority. And so I think it would again take away from the. So statistical agencies in general have, uh, I think, still have a very strong role to play. And I think that that's, 
I don't think that's actually going to change very much. Okay, so one last question right there, and then we are gonna we're gonna wrap up. I am a student. You're um, a student. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so not only do you get one, but you get one for a friend. So I guess I'm just curious um, to hear your comment about um, just, I guess, uh, the prospect of moving more toward renewable energy and if that's a, it's another thing, I guess, that is tossed around um, in elections and I'm curious about how much, um, like, power the, you know, the federal government, the executive branch actually has right. to drive that and if you think that that's renewable a feasible energy. thing. Yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things that uh, is in the annual energy outlook, this is the U.S. energy outlook and there's a 2017 one, is you can look Renewables are actually going to grow faster than any other form of energy in the U.S. Uh, so solar and wind have really high penetration rates. And that's certainly being helped in the very near term. So between now and 2022 by the ex five-year extension of the tax uh, credits that were available for renewables. It got built into, interestingly, got built into the law that allowed crude oil exports. So we actually had recently had a case where there was actually bipartisan agreement on something that people said, you know, we really ought to allow trade, let's allow crude oil to be exported. EIA says it's not going to cause gasoline to do very much, it has net economic benefits, why don't we do it? And, and there were other people that said, yeah, and you know what, this whole idea of having tax credits for renewables that expire every year is just creating crazy financial incentives for people to like do stuff before the end of the year. Why don't we, and we've been extending it anyways, why don't we just make that real? And so we're gonna get a lot of, of renewables going on. The cost curves have been coming down. So wind actually can probably, in some places, wind is gonna be very competitive with, with uh, fossil energy without subsidies. Uh, solar still has a ways to go. Uh, on that, but it's certainly possible uh, that, that that could happen. But one of the problems, that there's two problems that you run into. And one is that in, in the U.S., even with renewables growing faster than anything else, uh, 20 years from now, we're still going to be mainly reliant on fossil fuels because of the need for, you know, two things, uh, gasoline and diesel fuel, and jet fuel for transportation, uh, and natural gas for electricity. And it's really hard to get away from that. Uh, you just can't generate enough electricity with renewables uh, economically um, uh, without some kind of technological change. <laughs> uh, a battery, you know, so if somebody invents a battery, uh, that really works, that's going to be revolutionary. It could have the same impact that shale technology had on oil and gas production. So we'll, we'll look for that one. Uh, internationally, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting one. I was, I, I, I was, I've done this a couple of times. How many people here have been to India? You know, and, right. So this is a fairly decent group. And have you seen the slums? Like, have you been anywhere near the slums in Mumbai? Right. So I, I've actually seen five or six hands up. So I have, the, I have this <laughs> moral dilemma. I'm concerned about pollution. I, I think that carbon dioxide could really be a, a serious problem. And yet, the people who live in the slums in Mumbai don't have electricity, and I think it's morally wrong to deny them that electricity, even if it comes from coal because that's probably how India is going to get the electricity. So I'm like, I'm like incredibly conflicted, <laughs> you know, on that issue. So the, I don't know what the, the way out is, like we really need to think about the technology. We might need to, to figure out some way that people in India can get cleaner energy, but if it's more expensive, how is that, you know, you can see the, the dimensions of this problem are, are huge. And so, Renewables might not be the, the answer as we currently know it for India, and, and we're going to have to deal with that. In China, what they're trying to do, China is being driven by this terrible pollution that they have in all their major cities. It's like Pittsburgh in 1950. And, and what we had was the Clean Air Act, and we, we found ways to clean up the air. 
So China's, I think, going to you know go through the same thing. China is going to build. The plans are in China in the next 20 years, 25 years, China will build as much nuclear power as we have in the entire United States right now and we're the world's leader in terms of installed nuclear capacity. So they want, you know, that's how they were thinking of going to, to clean power. Uh, but China's also leading the way in, in renewables. A lot of the technology in solar and, uh, and more efficient wind uh, equipment is coming out of China, and they're very interested in doing that in China. Uh, so one of the interesting things that I find in the, in the, in the uh, uh, with uh, the Trump administration is is that one of the things that has been rolled back is the fuel efficiency standards for automobiles. And China is actually going the other way. They're kind of looking at their situation. China is consuming 12 million barrels a day of oil. And they're only producing about 4 million barrels a day of oil. So they're importing as much oil now as we were 10 years ago when we wanted to be energy independent. So China is, all of the things that we're rolling back, the Chinese are rolling in. <laughs> and I think it's, it's kind of interesting just to see um, how, where you are in a particular economic cycle or political cycle makes a huge difference to them to the, the policies that, that seem to be popular. And we've run over by five minutes. I yeah. apologize for that. Um, well, this has been Tom, super, thank you very much. Super thanks, interesting. Thanks thank you for you. joining us. Please welcome me and, uh, and thank you, Adam.